Um, so if I haven't got to meet you yet, my name is Matt Cordova. I'm the youth pastor here. And man, I just want to tell you, I'm so excited that you guys came to worship and to chase Jesus with us. I'm going to tell you some things that I tell our youth students on a weekly basis. So I tell them every week that every time we gather, whether it's here or Wednesday nights, um, that we have two goals. We want to grow with Jesus, right? That should be all of our goal is we want to know Jesus more. We want to go deeper, further, wider. We want to grow in our relationship with Jesus. But also, another reason we get together is we want to grow together, right? That's what the church is for, for us to encourage each other to keep living this life, right? There's a quote that I'll tell them is that if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, we go together. How many of you know that God has called us as the body of Christ to go far, go until he comes back. So if this is your first time here, we are a verse by verse. We go verse by verse through the Bible. We've been in the book of Luke. And just, just by poll, if we look out in the world, how many of you feel like our world needs more Jesus, right? Everybody. <laughs> just Everybody's like, yes. Well, this is why I like the book of Luke, because if we, if we believe that the world needs more Jesus, then we also need to understand that God has called us to do that, right? He said, you are the light of the world, to go and live like him, to, to share his message, to replicate, like, but ultimately like be transformed into his image would be how Paul would say it in 2 Corinthians. So if we want to look like Jesus, then we need to look at him, right? You ultimately start to imitate what you look at the most. You want to know why your kids know all the, the TikTok quotes and stuff like that? Guess what they're looking at, right? They're imitating what they see. We do the same thing. Now, one thing that I tell them all the time is there's a, a quote or a verse that Jesus says in John 14, 12, that I think is one of the most empowering things that we can often forget. And jo Jesus says this, he says, to those who believe in me, they will do the same works. Everybody say the same. The same works as I and greater. Listen, Jesus has invited us to participate in his ministry. He's invited us to walk out and to continue what he did as his Holy Spirit comes inside of us to go and share, to go and love, to go and pray, to do great things. Listen, we are called to do great things for Jesus, right? If, if you got a Bible, we're going to look at one of my favorite stories today. If you got it, open up to Luke Chapter 19, verse 1. Um, this is also a great time to download our app. We have a kind of a fill in the blank style notes in there. Uh, you can also, it'll also, we call it the Sky Bible. It'll be up here on the screen as well. And I just want to remind you that how many of you know that you get a bigger mansion in heaven if you take notes? That's not true, but it can't, it can't hurt, right? It can't hurt. Note takers are world changers. So it's been a couple weeks since we've looked at Luke. So let me give you a little refresh. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, right? What's in Jerusalem? It's the cross. Ever since the Mount of Transfiguration said he has set his, his face towards Jerusalem, we know he's going to the cross. He knows what's coming up. He's well aware of it. But I also think about the text in Hebrews where it says the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross, scoring his shame. So I think he's aware of the pain that he's about to go through, but I also think he's also understanding of the joy that is coming, right? The, the potential for people to know God and to be right with God again. So in the last uh, two weeks ago, Brandon covered two major encounters that are very opposite of each other. One was the rich young ruler. This guy has everything. He's wealthy. He's got influence. He's got power. And he comes to Jesus and says, hey, how do I get eternal life? Jesus looks into his heart and sees that God isn't the God of his life, but money is. So he says, hey, here's what I want you to do. I want you to give your money. I want you to give your God away and follow me. And the Bible says that he leaves sad. So in this encounter, you have a man who has everything that the world can offer, rejects God, and because of that, he leaves sad. The next encounter is just upon entering Jericho, we run into a man named Bartimaeus. Here's what we know about Bartimaeus. He's blind and he's a beggar. He has nothing. But Jesus comes passing by and he screams out to him. He recognizes him as the son of God. He says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And by the end of the story, a man who has nothing worldly has everything eternally and leaves praising God. Very opposite encounters. There's something I want us to hold on to as we dive into today's text. Because 
it, after his encounter with the rich young ruler, Jesus has this conversation. He says that it is impossible for the rich to inherit the kingdom of God. He says, in fact, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Now, everybody there was like, so who can be saved? And this is what Jesus says. What is impossible for people is possible with God. I want us to hold on to that today. Um, so we're about to dive into Luke chapter 19. I'm gonna invite my friend Michelle Bayless up to lead us in that. Can we all stand for the reading of God's word? Good morning, my name is Michelle Bayless. I attend the City Church with my kids, Emily, Ashton, Xander, Jaden, and Kinley. I am part of the Gonzalez City Group, and I also volunteer with First Impressions and City Youth every week. Today we're gonna to be reading Luke 19, verses one through 10. Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy, but the people were displeased. He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor Lord, and if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, Salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. You guys can be seated. Thank you, Michelle. Let's, uh, let's pray. So, dearly, Father, God, we just thank you for your word. God, and I pray that it would strengthen us, stretch us, challenge us, and mold us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Hey, man. Are, th are there anybody in here like moviegoers like you love the movies some of y'all are like I don't know if I can raise my hand in church yeah okay yeah like any moviegoers yeah like okay so we like we love movies is there anybody here that goes to the movies so much you should have been an investor anybody okay okay we're not the only oh it's so freeing in Jesus name I love that oh uh, we love movies like our ideal date night when we were like dating and then when we had, when we were married before kids was like, we were going to go to dinner and a movie. And then they started making movie theaters where they bring the food to you. And we were just like, this is the world. Like we are, we are moving in the right direction. And then after that, we had a kid and Bradley's now at the age where he can go to movies. So we have a legit reason to go watch animated movies. So like, we're about all the movies, but here's the kind of the idea I want to work around is what makes a great movie. What makes a great movie? Now, I think it's different for different people, right? If we're going to be completely honest, we have different tastes. We have different things that we like. For example, we have some people in here that like action packed stuff, like movies like Avengers or Creed. Like that's kind of your jam. You're like, everything's building to this big fight scene. And after you buy the movie, maybe you just skip to that scene and you watch it over 45 different times. And you're like, this is my thing. Like you just like action packed stuff. You like seeing people get punched in the face. Okay. Okay, that's just, just how it is. That's your kind of movie. For some of y'all, y'all are romance people. Mm. You're just like, man, there's a guy and a girl and there's distance or problems. She got kidnapped or speaks a foreign language. He's in debt. Like they end up together somehow. You know what I mean? They just, it just always works out in the end. That's you. Uh, anybody like scary movies? Okay, we're going to pray for y'all in the red room after service. <laughs> Do not sign me, I'll cry. Don't sign me up for scary. Um, for me, I'll tell you what makes a good movie. It's the storyline. It's all about the storyline, right? To me, there's nothing more frustrating than seeing a trailer and you're like, oh my gosh, this movie's gonna be so good. And then you get there to the movie and then within the first 15 minutes, you're like, I already know what's gonna happen. Like I, at that point, I'm, I'm completely disconnected. I can't tell you how many movies I've fallen asleep in, right? Even on date night, I feel bad, don't judge me. But for me, my favorite movies are the movies that keep you on edge. 
right? You're watching them. And you know, I think everybody kind of has this. You're trying to develop the plot in your, in your mind as you're watching the movie. And as the movie unfolds and starts to unravel, like the bad guy or even the good guy, you're like, I never knew that they were going to do that. I always thought they were just kind of a side character. I didn't know he was going to stab the guy. Like, I didn't know, like, you know what I mean? That's my kind of movie. When it catches me off guard, that's what it's, it's a plot twist, right? A plot twist is when something happens that you didn't see coming. See, in today's text, Jesus is very literally in the last week of his ministry. He's very literally in the last week of his ministry. He's passing through Jericho and he has two major encounters. He's got blind Bartimaeus on one side and he's about to have another on the other side. Now, Jericho is a highly trafficked place, right? And word has gone out that Jesus is passing through. And because Jericho is highly trafficked, there are tax booths all around it. And that introduces our next character. It's a man named Zacchaeus. Now here's what we know about Zacchaeus. One, he's a tax collector. Tax collectors were like the worst people in Jewish culture. Like they were seen as the worst of sinners. And here's why. Most of them, actually they were, they were Jewish people working for the Roman government. So they were Jews working for those unclean Gentiles, right? And then there was usually a tax for everything. Like Rome taxed people for everything. So they were taxing their own people for the suppressive government. And many of them were extremely wealthy because they would overtax and pocket the money. So they work for these unclean Gentiles who is an oppressive government and they're robbing from their own people. Can you see why the Jews wouldn't like them? Now there's something different about Zacchaeus that's uh, not mentioned anywhere else is that he is the chief tax collector. Chief tax collector. So he's probably the head guy for all of the tax booths in the entire region. So he's kind of a big deal. He's probably loaded. He's balling outrageous. You know what I mean? He's got all kinds of money. The other thing that's really interesting that we need to hold on to is Zacchaeus means righteous one. Means righteous one. We need to understand that when they name people back in the Bible, it wasn't the same way that we do. We like what's catchy, what's cool, what's different. There's some crazy names. Go spend some time on Google. You'll see what people are naming their kids, right? That's not how it was in that time. They named people based on either how they encountered them their character, or who they would become. Zacchaeus' name means righteous one. The last one is Zacchaeus is not very tall. I think it's ironic the short pastor gets the short story, okay? <laughs> I'm gonna tell you something, I'm gonna teach you something. I'm gonna change your world. You ready? Uh, did you know cold is a made up word to describe the absence of heat? So realistically, Cold only exists on your thermostats at home. Like it's not a real thing. It's the absence of heat. I think short was a made up word to define the absence of, the t of tall. Like if we're gonna be honest, I've been called short my whole life. Y'all are wrong. Me and Zacchaeus, we're tall. Y'all are just taller, okay? <laughs> Zacchaeus is a, is a tall guy. Not so tall, lack of tall, short. He's all those things. So here's what we, we've got it set up. Jesus is passing through Jericho. He's on the other side of Jericho. We know about Zacchaeus. This is what verse three says. It says, he tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too, not tall enough to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and, and, and he climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road for Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and he called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. So Zacchaeus, he knows, he hears these stories that Jesus is passing through. And the NLT says he tried to get a look at Jesus. I love how the NIV says it. The NIV says he wanted to see Jesus. He wanted to see Jesus. And because he was short, he ran ahead. He saw the path that Jesus was on, sees this tree. He runs ahead and he climbs this tree. What's interesting to me is Zacchaeus was willing to do what nobody else was willing to do to see somebody he's just heard stories about. And it makes me want to ask this question this morning is what are you risking to see Jesus? What are you, 
we're, when is the last time we wanted to see Jesus, first and foremost? You know what I mean? Like, he wanted to see Jesus, and because he wanted to see Jesus, he took a risk to see Jesus. So what are we risking to see Jesus? Listen, you cannot grow in your faith without risk. You can't. If you're in a place where you don't know what door to walk through, where to turn, like what the next step is, you are in a perfect place to grow in your faith. If you are uncertain, you are in the right spot to grow in your faith. You know why? Because you don't have the answers and you have to trust on God. You know what I mean? Many times, and listen, this is a conviction to me too, because I've been asking this question for me personally. Many times we depend on our own logic and resources and we want to call that faith. No, that's faith in the wrong thing. That's faith in you or faith in the dollar bill. When is the, what, like in what area of our life are we actually saying like, God, listen, if you don't show up, this ain't going to work. God, if you don't show me the door, I don't know what to do. I mean, that's, that's risk. You're like, well, Matt, what risk did Zacchaeus take? Well, one, he ran and he climbed a tree. Pastor Clayton has told us many times that men in that culture did not run. It was literally a loss of dignity for a man to run. Much less a Roman official. Roman officials don't run and you're not gonna see them hanging out in trees. You know what I mean? But what's interesting is Jesus has just taught what it was like. like he's like, unless you have faith like a, what, a child, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. What do children do? They run and they climb. Man, my five-year-old doesn't walk anywhere. You know what I mean? But that's what kids do. They run and they climb. So this person that is seemingly irredeemable to their culture actually has the most childlike faith out of anybody that's following Jesus at this time. But he, the risk he takes is he runs and he climbs. On one side, he's not to associate with the Jews because he works for Rome. On the other side, the Jews hate him because he works for Rome. So he can't hang out with his people because of who he works for and his people don't like him because of who he works for. And then eventually he's going to be surrounded by people that don't like him. When is the last time you walked into a crowd of people that don't like you? Nobody's signing up for that. But he's about to do that, right? Then he's a short guy in a tree. Tall, there's a reason we're not tall, right? We're not supposed to be that high off the ground, just for real. All right, I'm gonna get off the short train, okay? Here's what hits me. When I was studying this, this is what stands out to me, is that Jesus sees everybody who takes the risk. Jesus sees everyone who takes the risk. When I was running through this, like one of the first stories that comes to my mind is this woman with the issue of blood for 12 years. Right, Jesus is there, a guy named Jairus' daughter is sick, and he's like, hey Jesus, can you come heal my daughter? And Jesus starts walking to where his daughter is, and, and there's a tight crowd. The language, the, the original language, uh, uses a word that, that says like, the crowd was so tight as if to crush a man. And then you have this, this other character, this woman, who's been bleeding for 12 years, who's invis inv like used all of her resources, spent all of her resources on doctors who don't have the answer or the solution. And she hears that Jesus is passing through. And in her mind, she's like, if I could just touch his jacket, if I could touch his cloak, I'll be here. It wasn't like, hey, if I could ask him or hey, if I could, uh, you know, if he would just pray for me. It was like, no, if I could just touch his jacket. So what does she do? That she pushes through this tight crowd and lays her hand on his cloak, and the Bible says that, the, that Jesus felt the power leave him. What was her risk? She's not supposed to be in the crowd. Jewish cleanliness laws, she's supposed to be away from everybody. But because of her faith in who Jesus was, she pushes through the cloud, the crowd touches his cloak, then Jesus feels the power leave, and I love it, because at the beginning of the story, we don't know what her name is, but at the end of the story, she's referred to as a daughter of God. Because she took the risk. What about Bartimaeus? Bartimaeus' livelihood is dependent on where he's stationed. If he's not on a highly trafficked road, he's not going to get a whole bunch of money and food. So he's on this highly trafficked road, begging so that he can make it another day. And he hears this crowd pass by. They're like, hey, what's going on? He's like, well, Jesus is passing through. And he starts to shout, Jesus! Son of David, have mercy on me. The crowd, dude, be quiet. You're, you're embarrassing us. Could, could you keep it down, please? 
And Barty goes, just shouts louder, Jesus, son of David. Here's what's interesting to me. There is a crowd full of people surrounding Jesus. It's loud. And you have one man yelling over here. Which one did Jesus hear? The one who took the risk. Then you got Zacchaeus here, and he's doing everything that he can to see Jesus. Jesus sees everybody who takes the risk. Now, I think there are a couple things that keep us from taking risk. One is I think we've gotten too comfortable. Listen, if you know my story before we moved to the city, I was leading a church in Panhandle. You know what I mean? And, um, you know, the statistic at that time, and I think it's around the same, was somebody that was considered a committed Christian went to church once every six to eight weeks. Once every six to six to eight weeks. It was like, man, I'm a, church, I'm a Jesus follower. Da, 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 I'm once every six to eight weeks. By the way, there's not a scriptural backing Lone Star Christianity or like Lone Ranger Christianity. You know what I mean? There's not a scripture that supports that. So COVID hits and we all have to shut down and there's an uproar from the Christian community, right? They're taking church away. We're being persecuted. After hearing that uproar, I'm excited for when we open up. I'm like, this was our trend. Maybe this is what it takes to shake the trend. We get back into church and it's still the same thing. We wanted to fight for it when it was being taken away. But what is a necessity in our life has now become a negotiation. You know what I mean? We've gotten just too comfortable with, hey, I, do you feel like going to church this morning? It, it's interesting if we understood that tr the reason we go to church is not for us, but to praise God and to encourage other people. I think we'd shift our perspective. Hebrews 10 says, don't stop gathering, but continue to encourage each other on. What if the person down the road from you needs your worship? Not you worshiping them, but to see you worship God. You know I mean, we, uh, we've gotten comfortable with chasing sports more than chasing Jesus. We've gotten more comfortable with reading text messages and emails than we do our Bible. And I actually think it was Zacchaeus' discomfort that caused him to run ahead and climb the tree. You know what I mean? He, he's, he's a Jew and he's hated by Jews. He's rejected and despised by them. He works for a system that doesn't care for him, just what he does. And he knows, he is conscientious of the fact that he's robbing from his own people. But now there's this guy that is going through town who he knows, he's heard stories, has healed the sick, who sits with sinners and more specifically tax collectors, right? And he sees the rejected of, the, of society. He's like, listen, I've got to move. I'm not comfortable where I am. I've got to go. Hope is passing right in front of him. So what does he do? He runs ahead. He climbs the tree. So one, I think we've gotten too comfortable. The other one is I think we're too worried about what others think. I think we care way too much. Listen, we don't go ask people to pray for us because we're worried they might judge us. But how, are, how is the church supposed to encourage you to go forward with your faith if you don't allow them to come alongside you in your faith? For many of us, like this is our, our worship stance. We, we stand like this. We're afraid to raise our hands or, I mean, fall to our knees. Like, well, Matt, that's just girly. Okay, well, let me tell you a story about a man named David. Okay, David, this guy's a king. He uh, slayed giants, killed lions, and killed bears. And in this story... The Ark of the Covenant is coming into his town. The Ark of the Covenant is a big deal because that's where the presence of God resided. So as the Ark of, Covenant, uh, Ark of the Covenant is coming into his town, the Bible says that David is like jumping and dancing and singing and going crazy. And he's wearing like, a, a, it's, a, it's a priestly garment, a linen, evil. it's like he's in his underwear. Basically like, they, I don't encourage that on Sunday mornings. Hear me, hear me. But the attire. You could do the action, not the, you know what I mean? But David is like so excited that the presence of God is in his place that he goes and he starts dancing and he's going crazy. That's what mattered most to him 
was that the presence of God was there. And of course, you know, I mean, just like in any other story, somebody has something to say. So his wife is up in, in their room and David's going around blessing people because he's excited. He's like, man, life has just entered our place. So I'm gonna bless your family. I'm gonna bless your family. I'm gonna bless your family. And he, the Bible says he literally comes home to bless his family and his wife despises him. Oh, David, look at you. Look at how you embarrass yourself. You gonna do that again? That's gross. And I love David's response. He says, listen, I would become even more undignified than this. I would do it again and make it look worse in your eyes because it's about the presence of God. It's about letting people see that he's still alive, that he's still moving, that he's still breaking chains, that he's still opening doors, that he's still setting captives free, that God's presence is here. And as long as God's presence is here, we can be blessed, we can thrive, we can grow. Right? That's what mattered most to David. It wasn't what everybody else thought. In fact, it was actually David's worship that led to the whole town worshiping. If you read it, the whole town goes, man, listen, what if you holding back your worship is keeping somebody from, hold, from letting loose in their worship? Well, Matt, that's girly. Okay, when's the last time you killed a bear or giant? Just being real. It's not about, I mean, listen, we raise our hands not to please other people, but because God is that good. We fall to our knees because God is that good. He is that powerful. He's been here. He's for us. He loves us. It's not about what everybody else thinks. Paul, Paul says it super bluntly in Galatians. He says, do I do this to please people? No, because if I did, I wouldn't be a servant of God. Huh. If my worship is about everybody else's opinions, it's no longer worship. It's not a, like I can't be a servant of God if I'm worried about what everybody else thinks. Oh. Here's the question I want to ask. Is uh, what encounter are we letting the fear of people rob from us? When it comes down to it, what encounter are we letting the fear of people rob from us? See, Zacchaeus takes the risk and Jesus sees him and he calls him by name. Then verse six says, Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and he said, I'll give half of my wealth to the poor, Lord. And if I have cheated people on their taxes, I'll give them back four times as much. Remember at the beginning of the story, Zacchaeus is what? He's in a tree. Guess where he is now? In the crowd. He's in the crowd of people who don't like him, that reject him. I mean, you saw they called, the, you see how they perceive him. He's a notorious sinner. And guess what? He's not afraid. Like, I'm gonna be real. If I was in a crowd of people that didn't like me, I might be a little nervous, but not Zacchaeus. And so, in fact, it says that he's filled with excitement and joy. Why? Well, one, Jesus saw him and he called him by name. And because Jesus does that, it's interesting to me because the crowd has something to say. At first, they were all excited Jesus was passing through, but they were complaining when it, when it came down to who Jesus chose to sit with. Did y'all notice that? I'm, I'm convinced that if Jesus would have chose somebody outside of uh, people that were tax collectors, they would have probably been okay with it, but they had something to say. They were, they were bothered with the fact that they chose, that Jesus chose Zacchaeus. Like, come on, bro, for real? Like all of us here, you're gonna, you're gonna sit with him. We're all true Jews, or if it was today, we're the real Christians, right, Jesus? This dude's a thief. How are you going to waste your time with him? It makes me think, of the religious leaders that Jesus encounters when he calls Matthew. If you didn't know, Matthew was a tax collector who's one of his 12 disciples. Jesus goes to eat with Matthew and other tax collectors and the religious leaders walk up to the disciples and this is what they ask him. They say, hey, why does your master eat with sinners? The funny part of this story is the disciples were with Jesus. So they're asking, the, they're asking about Jesus while Jesus is right there. They could have skipped them and gone straight to him, right? But I want to ask something. Jesus dines with the sinners of society. Is it possible that we don't reach the people that Jesus reaches because we won't sit with the people that Jesus sat with? Matt, if you knew their history, well, Jesus removes people's history. You know what I mean? If you knew what they were like, okay, well, Jesus knows what they were like. 
Judas struggled with money. He was part of his crew and he put him in charge of it. You know what I mean? Uh, you know what the beauty of Jesus is? Oh. If, if that's what it comes down to, like I think we're, we're missing out on, on God's heart. Like, because the story that comes to my mind is Jesus washing the disciples' feet. You know, he washed Peter's feet and he knew Peter would deny him. That happened before Peter, Jesus washed Jesus' feet before Peter would deny him. We won't sit with people because what they might do. Jesus knew what he would do. He said he washed Thomas's feet and he knew he'd doubt him. He washed Judas's feet and he knew he'd betray him. Listen, I'm thankful that we serve the Jesus that sits with the outcast. I'm thankful that we serve the Jesus that leaves the 99 for the one. And if we are not thankful for that, then maybe we forgot that we at one point in our life, we were that one person. You know what I mean? When Jesus came and found you, when Jesus came and sought you out, I bet you were thankful that he left the 99 for the one, right? And that's exactly what is going on. Jesus sees the one. He's in a tree. He calls him out. Ever, the 99 are upset. <laughs> the other people are upset. Jesus doesn't care. But Zacchaeus gets out of the tree and here's what he does. He says, you know what, Jesus, they're right. I think you should dine with somebody else. Don't waste your time with me. No, that's not what he does. In fact, he does something that I think is pretty radical. He publicly repents. Right? He, he publicly changes direction. He publicly changes his mind. He didn't do it in a closet. He's like, hey, Jesus is right here. I'm going to do it right now. He says, I'm going to give half of my wealth to the poor. And Jesus, if I've cheated somebody, I'm going to give them back four times, which is way more than what the religious law required. Now, here's the question. Why? Because Jesus saw him. He does this because Jesus saw him. See, I told you, we looked at, at the beginning and it says Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus. But the truth is this, Jesus was actually looking for him. Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus, but Jesus was looking for him. See, something we need to understand, Brandon mentioned this in his message too a couple of weeks ago, is Jesus is the one seeking us out. Remember, he leaves the 99 for the one. He's looking for the one. He's seeking us out. And if you're here today and you've said yes to Jesus, it's because he sought you, found you, and he gave you sight like he did Bartimaeus. It's because he's seeking us out. The crazy part about this story is, I, I don't know if you've looked up sycamore trees, but they have giant leaves. It would have been easy for Zacchaeus to hide himself from Jesus, but instead Jesus still called him by name. Why? Because he's looking for him. And the same is true today. For some of you, maybe you came in looking for hope. You're in a spot, you're like, man, this is, I'm at, I'm at rock bottom. There's nowhere to go. I don't know how I'm gonna get out of here. My marriage is in a wreck. My finances are in a spot that I don't know what to do. Some of you, maybe you're looking for healing. You've been battling with a sickness for a long time. You're like, medicine's not working. I've seen the doctor, I don't know how many times. Like, I don't know what's going on. Maybe you're looking for change. You feel like you're stuck in this constant cycle that's terrible. Maybe you're here looking for direction. I'm telling you what you're looking for. You're looking for Jesus. You're looking for Jesus. But if I'm gonna be completely honest with you, Jesus is looking for you and he's calling you by name. He's not calling you, hey, bro, girl. No, he didn't say, hey, dude, you in the tree. He says, Zacchaeus. Can I tell you something? The king of kings knows your name. The creator of the universe knows your name. In fact, the Bible says that his thoughts about you outnumber the grains of sand. About you individually, not you as humanity. 
Psalms 139 says that his thoughts about you outnumber the grains of sand. You matter to the King of Kings. And it doesn't matter how hard you tried to run or how far you try to run. The Bible says you can go to the tallest peak. He's there. You can go to the deepest valley. He's there. It doesn't matter how hard you try to hide. He sees you and he knows your name. And I love this because Zacchaeus, when he publicly repents, he doesn't do that to try to get right with Jesus. Hold on, Jesus, like before we could be good, let me do all this stuff. I did all these wrongs. Let me clean myself up. It's not how it goes. He repented because of what Jesus did. <laughs> and that what he, what we do, church, because of the finished work of the cross, because of him be defeating death in the grave, because of him giving us salvation, we repent, we change directions, we turn our minds. It was all because Jesus saw him and he called him by name. And I like, love verse nine and 10. It says, Jesus, it says, Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today. No, huh. Salvation comes when we respond to Jesus calling us by name. Salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save those who are lost. See, in Jesus' final week, he's still changing people's lives, right? He's not upset about the interruptions of the rich young ruler or upset about blind Bartimaeus yelling for him, or he's not even trying to rush this encounter with Zacchaeus. He's like, hey, I'm going to go dine at your house. Jesus is still on mission in the last seven days of his life. And he's still focused on why he's sent. But I want to show you the, the plot twist of this entire story because it's all around Zacchaeus. In the beginning, Zacchaeus is a thief. But at the end, he's overly generous. In the beginning, he's an outcast. In the end, he's a son of Abraham. In the beginning, he's a sinner. But right now, he is the righteous one. Do you remember what his name meant? His name was a revelation of who he would become, not who he was in that moment. He was once rich and lost, but now he is seen and saved into his culture. He is seemingly irredeemable. But now he's the son of God. Now he's got salvation. Do you know how his story ends? History tells us that he would continue to grow in his faith and serve Jesus the rest of his life. In fact, he would become the, the bishop of Caesarea. R.C. Sproul says this when he talks about it. He says, so this little man who climbed the tree to see Jesus left the lucrative money changing tables at the crossroads leading to Jerusalem and became a spiritual leader in his church. <laughs> because of what Jesus did, he became a spiritual leader, 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 leader in his church. That's what Paul tells us to do in Romans chapter 12, verse one. Some translations say in the light of the mercies of God, the new NLT says, because of what God has done for you, you should Offer your life as a living sacrifice. He says, this is your logical worship. Because of what God's done, we should live our life for him. That's what Zacchaeus did. He's like, man, because of, because Jesus saw me, I'm going to chase him. Because Jesus saw me, I'm going to tell people about him. You see, I told you at the beginning about the rich young ruler. Zacchaeus is literally the opposite of that. It's, it's amazing to me that Jesus would teach this moment where it's like, it's impossible for a rich man to inherit the kingdom of God. In fact, it's easier for uh, a camel to go through the eye of the needle. And just a couple days later, he shows how possible it is with him. You see, it's only Jesus that can take us through the, through the eye of the needle. Rich man couldn't give up his God. Zacchaeus realizes that money's just gravel in heaven. Jesus is what it's all about. So maybe you walked in today and you're like Zacchaeus. Maybe you're lost. Maybe you feel alone. Maybe you feel rejected. Maybe you feel outcasted. Maybe you feel terrible about what you're doing or what you've done. 
Maybe you're here, you're wondering if there's hope. Man, can it change? I'm here to tell you that there is. It's in Jesus. And just like with Zacchaeus, Jesus removes your history. I heard one pastor say it this way. He says, he removes your history so that you could live out his story. He removes your history. He removes your scorn. He removes your shame and he replaces it with salvation and righteousness. Why? Well, he said it in verse 10 because he came to seek and to save the lost. You see, that's the ultimate plot twist. It's not do better and try harder. It's believe and follow me. And maybe you're here and you feel like that's you, that Jesus is calling you my name. Man, I just wanna encourage you to fill out our form on our app, scan that QR code, because we wanna celebrate that moment with you. The Bible says that if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. That is recognizing the fact that, man, we are sinful people. But God so loved the world that he sent Jesus. And if we believe in him, that we'll have eternal life. We want to celebrate that moment with you. Heaven is. We do too. But for everybody else that said yes to Jesus, the other thing we need to see is Jesus' mission, right? I came to seek and to save the lost. How many of you understand we're called to do the same thing? Matthew chapter 28, you have the Great Commission where it says, go and make disciples of all nations. The Greek word for go is wherever you're going. Wherever you are, make disciples. Listen, when you're at home, you're making disciples. When you're at work, you're making disciples. When you're making your kids lunch, you're making disciples. When you're at the movies, you're making disciples. Right, that's our call. That is our commission. Our commission is not to just attend church. And I think that's what we've equated faith to is, hey, I, I check my box. I'm here on Sunday. I did my version Bible reading plan. We're good. No, like this is for us to be encouraged to continue to live out our faith so that when we walk out these doors, we understand we're walking out into the mission field. We're going out to seek and to save the lost. We're going out to tell them, hey, listen, I don't know where you are, but there's hope and it's in Jesus. Hey, I know you're struggling, but listen, there's life and life to the full and it's in Jesus, right? You are the what? The light of the world. Is what Jesus said. Nobody lights a candle and puts it underneath a basket. No, they elevate it. They put it on a, a shelf so it lights up the whole room. So go let your good deeds shine. Why? So people will praise your Father. Listen, I'm telling you, don't let these four walls be a basket. We come here and we build each other up. We come here and we let the word of God speak life into us. And then we charge out there and we shine a light so that people see God. Daryl Bach says this, he says, the church must become the means for restoring the lost and rejected. Well, how? By seeking them out, not remaining isolated from them. Listen, you can't change a world you're not involved with. can't change a world you're not involved with. So maybe the risk that God is calling us to this morning is sharing our testimony for the first time. You know what I mean? Maybe it's sitting with those that Jesus would sit with. Maybe it's seeing those that Jesus would see and seeing them how Jesus would see them for who they could become, not who they are in the moment. But I want to remind you, Jesus sees everyone who takes the risk. Let's pray. So dear Heavenly Father God, thank you for seeing us. God, and I pray that we never get over that day. But God, I pray that you would fan into flame this urgency to go and share your word. God, I think about Isaiah chapter six, God, where he has this encounter where he sees you, he sees the angels worshiping, and then you have this conversation where like, well, who's gonna be our messenger? And Isaiah, he's like interrupts and he goes, send me, send me. God, I pray that that is the cry of our heart, God, that we would go and seek and save the lost, that when you're looking for somebody to send, that we would say, God, send me. I'm your guy, I'm your girl. God, let me be the one. 
But God, I pray that you would, man, just take the comfort away. Challenge us, push us, convict us. In Jesus' name, and everybody say, amen.